Reverend Dr. Pavitra Bharatwaj. I am Associate Professor at the Department of Computer Science, Jesus and Mary College, University of Delhi. So friends, we have been talking about uh, operating systems in the past few uh, lectures of this series. And in the last series, uh, last few lectures of the series, we were talking about a very interesting topic uh, that is the deadlocks and how deadlocks are handled by operating system. So, today's lecture is in continuation with the previous lectures. So, in case you want to uh, go back and see the lectures, you can do that. And before we begin today's discussion, we will have a quick recap of uh, what we had discussed in the previous lectures. So, we know that you know what is the deadlock condition. So, in in processes, in multiprocessor, uh, in multiprocess environment, multiprogramming environment, where more than one process you know is executing, then there is a situation which can come in which each process is waiting for an event that is you know occurring, uh, that is uh, that is to be held or that is uh, you know to to be initiated by another process. Right. So, basically there are multiple processes and each process is waiting for an event that is triggered or that is to take place by another process which in turn is waiting for some other event. So, like this there is a situation where none of the processes they are moving ahead. Why? Because they are all waiting for something which is again waiting for something else, a process which is waiting for something. Now, what is this something or what is this event? This is basically resource acquisition and resource release, right. So, we had done multiple examples of you know how uh, processes they keep on waiting and how resources in the system are limited and all processes they compete for those resources. Now, if there are multiple you know factors basically there are multiple conditions which uh, you know necessitate that deadlocks will occur or which characterize the situation of a deadlock right so if you want to know that what are the conditions or what are the necessary conditions which will cause a deadlock in a system so there are basically there are four main conditions or we what we say that four necessary conditions which when hold simultaneously in a system they result in a deadlock right now what are those four conditions so the first condition is mutual exclusion mutual exclusion basically means that there is one resource at least one resource you know which must be held in a non shareable mode non shareable mode means that if a process claims or if a process you know acquires that resource then no other process can use that resource at any given time only one process will use the resource right so if another process wants the same resource then the process has to wait right either the resource has to be released by the process or the process has to wait after requesting for the particular resource right now this is a classic example of mutex locks which we had done when we were doing you know we were doing uh, process synchronization mutex locks are a classic example of non shareable resource you cannot share a mutex lock so once the lock has been acquired then the other process has to wait for that particular lock to be released but another example could be a file which is opened in a read only mode right so that is a perfect example of a shareable resource because n number of processes can read the file if it is available in a read only mode because no process is changing the file they are all wanting to read from the file so therefore there is no need for something called mutual exclusion another condition is hold and wait now what is hold and wait that is one process is holding one resource at least one resource and it is waiting to acquire additional resources which are actually being held by another processes right. So this means that I have not yet got all the resources but I am still waiting and to start the execution because I have got some of the resources and for the others I am waiting. Now, for this also there are you know algorithms how we can handle this. So, if we say that you know uh, if, uh, if a process can only start when it has acquired all the resources 
right this is one approach to doing this that we will not allow a process to start unless it has obtained all the resources another approach could be that a process you know it acquires it takes the resources as and when it needs and then it keeps on releasing so the no process is going to hold on to the resources so in this case you know uh, also this condition will also necessitate that a deadlock will occur because all processes will hold a few resources and they will wait for the other resources which are in turn being held by the other process then the third condition was no preemption so pre no preemption means that once the resource has been given to a process then it can only be released by that process voluntarily that is only when the process completes it terminates then the resource will be freed so in this case uh, you know uh, the resources should be able to be preempted that is if a process is you know not utilizing a resource or if a process of higher priority wants the resource then the resource should be preempted the process should be made to leave the resource right and the last condition is the circular wait condition in which we had discussed that we have a set of waiting processes and all these processes they must exist so that each process is waiting for a resource which is held by another process in the set right so each of the processes is waiting for other processes right so now we know that if we understand that a deadlock has to occur then all four of these conditions have to be true right at the same time all four of the conditions have to be true if you know if any one of the condition is not true if is not meeting then a deadlock cannot occur right so we have a solution in hand that we can prevent these four conditions to occur at the same time in any system now the next thing is that when we are looking at different methods of handling deadlocks or different approaches of treating or dealing with this problem of deadlocks so we see that there are multiple approaches so the first approach that we had seen was to prevent a deadlock from occurring or to avoid a deadlock from occurring that is we will try and maintain that the system will never enter a deadlock state another approach could be that we allow the system to enter the deadlock state we detect the deadlock and then we recover from the deadlock and the third approach is that we completely ignore the problem and we we don't assume we assume that there are no deadlocks occurring and then we uh, therefore uh, you know we are sort of using the ostrich approach and uh, you know the thing is interesting point is that most of the operating systems they are using the third approach that is they leave this task of deadlock handling to the application programmer so application programmers they have to write the programs which will handle the deadlocks and operating system has got no role to play in this so first thing that we see is how we can prevent and avoid the deadlock so basically the idea of prevention of deadlocks is that you prevent the four conditions of mutual exclusion circular wait no preemption to occur and therefore you can prevent the deadlocks from occurring so therefore we have these four conditions and now we only have to ensure that the four conditions do not occur simultaneously so the, we will have the methods or we have certain algorithms which will prevent deadlock by constraining how requests for resources can be made because it is basically deadlocks are occurring because of uh, requests coming in from the various uh, processes for various resources now the the next approach is that we look at deadlock avoidance avoidance means that you know the operating system is given additional information in advance right concerning which resources a process will request and use during its lifetime so before the process starts this information has to be given now this is an additional knowledge you know which the operating system will use and it will decide whether the request can be granted or not so whether the process can start or whether the process will have to wait because the resources that the process requires are not available so to decide whether you know the current request can be satisfied or the process has to be delayed the system has to consider the resources which are available 
the resources which have been allocated to the different processes and the future requests and release of each process. So, basically the operating system will have to keep a complete inventory of all the resources which may have been allocated, which may be available or which may be required for uh, allocation at a later stage. So, deadlock prevention basically will ensure that the four conditions will never occur at the same time that is mutual exclusion must not hold ok that is at least one resource which is used should be available in non shareable mode. Then resource hold and wait will not occur that is no uh, process can hold the resources if it is not getting the other resources that it needs. No preemption should take place that is you know uh, the resources can be preempted no preemption of resources which have already been allocated and the circular weight condition should also be violated. So, now what happens is that when we are using these prevention strategies that when we are trying to you, you know ensure that all these resource allocations are occurring in this way, we end up uh, in a situation where we have our overall reduced system throughput and the low device utilization. Why? Because you know we are not, we are devising strategies for resource allocation not with an aim or not with the goal of optimizing resource utilization, but with the aim of deadlock prevention. So, now the alternate method to prevention is actually to avoid the deadlocks, right? That is we will need additional information about how resources are to be requested, how the re uh, incoming processes are going to request. In prevention, we were looking at how resources are allocated. Now, we are looking at how resources will be are to be requested. So, now we have a complete you know knowledge of the complete sequence of request and release for each process. So, the system will decide whether or not the process should wait to avoid a possible future deadlock. So, if a process you know if, if there is a request which requires uh, you know uh, that there is a decision to be taken by the system, then if the resource is currently available, the resource is allocated to each process and the future requests and releases of each process are taken into account, right. So, in this case, in case of deadlock avoidance also, there are various algorithms which are used in this approach. Right, and these algorithms they differ in the amount and type of information required. So, for deadlock avoidance, uh, you know, like for deadlock prevention, we had different strategies. For deadlock avoidance, also, we are going to use the different strategies. So, simplest and the most useful model which is used will require that each process will declare the maximum number of resources of the each type that it may need right. So, this information that whichever process will have to declare in advance what is the type num, type of resources it needs and what is the maximum number of resources that it may require. This information is to be given a priori, a priori means before the process actually starts. So, the, after we have this information then you know we will work on a algorithm which will ensure that the system will never enter in a deadlock state, right. Because we will already know that what are the requirements of different processes. So, a deadlock avoidance algorithm will dynamically examine the resource allocation state to ensure that a circular weight condition can never exist. Circular weight condition means that the process P0 is waiting for the process P1 to complete, P1 is waiting for the process P2 to complete, P2 is waiting for Pn and Pn is waiting for P0. So, likewise there is a circular weight, but these algorithms for avoidance will make sure that this kind of a scenario will never occur. So, resource allocation state is defined by the number of available and allocated resources and the maximum demand of the process. So, both the things are to be kept in mind. What is the total number of resources which is available and what is the maximum that the process may 
demand. Obviously, no process can demand more than what is available in totality. Right. So, for this you know uh, for the deadlock avoidance we look at two significant algorithms. So, first algorithm which is very important is the resource allocation graph algorithm and the second algorithm is the banker's algorithm. So, before we actually start looking at these algorithms we should first look at something called the safe state because these two algorithms are based on this concept of safe state right so what is safe state or when do we say that the system is safe right so a state is called safe if the system can allocate resources to each process in some order and still avoid a deadlock so basically a system is in a safe state only if there exists a safe sequence. What is safe sequence? Safe sequence is that sequence of processes when resources are allocated to the processes in a safe sequence then a deadlock will not occur, a deadlock will be avoided. So we are looking at a strategy to avoid deadlocks right. So, consider you know if we look at a sequence of processes say P1, P2 and Pn these are the different processes. So, what is a safe sequence for this current allocation? So, we will define that the safe sequence for the allocation will be that for each process Pi say the resource request that Pi can still make and can be satisfied by the currently available resources plus the resources which are held by all pj where pj are all j is less than i that is if we have a process say we have process p3 right and we have other processes say p1 and p2 which have already got the resources before p3 is getting so if p3 is asking for the number of resources which are total of available resources and the resources which are held by P1 and P2, then P3 can be given the resource, P3 can be allowed because P3's request can be satisfied. In this case, if this sequence is followed, then there will be no deadlock, the deadlock can be avoided. In this situation, if resources are you know which are uh, immediately needed or immediately available right if they are not available for pi then pi will have to wait wait until when until all the pjs have finished all the pj have finished means that all the processes which are holding the resources prior to pi they have finished so when all those processes they will finish then pi can obtain all of its needed resources complete its designated task and then it will return the allocated resources and terminate right. So, when PI terminates then only PI plus 1 can obtain its needed resources and so on right. So, if this sequence is not followed then we say that the system is unsafe or that the state is unsafe. So, the idea is that the any process will only start will only get the permission to start if the number of resources it requires is available or it is it will be available when the resources allocated to the its predecessor processes the processes which are currently running they are releasing the resource the process will only start in that case right so therefore what we are saying is we are trying to avoid the deadlock we are not allowing a process to start because we know that the resources that the process may need are not yet available it will only start when the resources are available so a safe state therefore you know is not a deadlocked state so in on the you know conversely we can also say that a deadlocked state is an unsafe state but we cannot say that all the unsafe states are deadlocks right an unsafe state may lead to a deadlock as long as the state is safe we can avoid the unsafe or therefore even deadlocked state so whenever we the or the system is in a safe state we are sure that a deadlock will not 
occur. But when a system goes into an unsafe state, then the operating system cannot prevent processes from requesting resources in such a way that the deadlock can occur. Right. So, basically the behavior of the processes will control the unsafe state. So, once the system goes into an unsafe state, then it is likely that the process, the system may also go in a deadlocked state. Right. So, if we look at this diagram, it is very clear that, you know, we have a safe state and we have a, a, an unsafe state of the system and within the unsafe state, we have a small portion where we can also go into a deadlock state. So, it is very clear that not all unsafe states are deadlock, but there is a possibility to go into deadlock when you are in the, when the system is in an unsafe state. Because how the processes will behave, how the processes will request the resources when the system is in unsafe, that can, you know, trigger any kind of deadlock, that can lead into any kind of deadlock. So, this understanding of safe state and unsafe state is very critical before we actually start, you know, discussing the algorithms for deadlock avoidance. So, first we see, you know, an illustration to understand how the system can go from a safe state to an unsafe state. So, this example, you know, it is very interesting example, okay. And in this we see that there is, there are 12 magnetic tape drives in a system and three processes P0, P1 and P2 which are using these system, right. Now, if at time T0, the system is said to be in a safe state, right. Why do we say that the system is in a safe state? Because we understand that initially, you know, the process P1 will be allocated the resources, Right, because it needs at time t, t0, the process P0 needs 5, the process P1 needs 2 and the process P2 needs 2 disk drives, right. So, initially the process uh, total, in total also therefore, at time T0, the system will have 3 spare tape drives, right, because 5 plus 2 plus 2. 9 will be allocated. So, because there are 12 tape drives, so at time T0, 3 tape drives are still available. So, the sequence which should be followed will be that first the, uh, you know, the process P1 will be allocated, the tape drives that it requires. After P1 finishes, then it will release all the tape drives. So, then there will be total 5 tape drives available. So, these 5 tape drives can be given to process P0. After process P0 executes and it will release all the tape drives, then the system will have 10 tape drives which will be available, which can be given to process P2 and therefore, after P2 releases, all the 12 tape drives will be free. So, in this sequence, that is, this is the safe sequence, that is first P1, then P0, then process P2 should execute. This will be a safe sequence, right. This, this will lead the system into a safe state. Now, on the contrary, this sequence that is, you know, P1, P0 and P2, this is the safety condition, right. Process P1 will be immediately allocated, then P0 will get all the tape drives and will return and then P2 will finally get. But now, we can see that even in the same scenario with the same number of tape drives, one wrong decision or one wrong allocation can still bring the system into an unsafe state, right. So, a, the system can go from a safe state to unsafe state simply by a small mistake. So, say again we look back at the same example. So, in this let us assume that you know at time T1, right, we had seen at T0 the system is in safe state. But at time T1, if we assume that the process P2 asks for one extra tape drive, one extra tape drive is asked for process by asked by process P2 and that extra tape drive is allocated to the process T, P2. Now, the system is not in a safe state, right? Why? Because now only process P1 can be allocated all its tape drives, right? And when it returns them, 
then the system will have only 4 available tape drives. Now, since P0 is allocated 5 tape drives, but has a maximum of 10, right. So, it may request 5 more tape drives. If it does so, it will have to wait because those are not available because already P1 is using them, right. So, therefore, process P2 may request 6 additional tape drives and it will wait resulting in a deadlock. So, we have a situation where each process is holding a small number of tape drives and it is requesting or it is waiting for other process to release the remaining number. So, this one mistake of you know granting the request from process P2 for one more tape drive has resulted into a deadlock. So, ideally what should have been done that process P2 should have been asked to wait, right. P2 should have been waited uh, till what time till either of the processes either P0 or P1 would have finished and they would have released all the resources. Then we could have avoided the deadlock situation, but because this was not done and P2's request was immediately granted, the system drifted from a safe state to an unsafe state. So, that is why it is very important that you know the uh, avoidance algorithm will ensure that the system will never go into a unsafe state, they will never enter into a deadlock. The idea is simply to ensure that the system will always remain in a safe state. So, initially the system is in a safe state, whenever a process requests a resource that is currently available, the system must decide whether the resource can be allocated immediately or whether the process which is requesting for the resource has to wait. So, if the request is granted, then only when the request will be granted, when the system uh, allows, when the system remains in the safe state. After allocation also, the system should remain in the safe state. So, if a process requests a resource which is currently available, it may still have to wait, right. Like we saw in the example that even though extra tape drives are there, but still it has, it should have been asked to wait, right. So, resource utilization definitely may be lower and then it would be otherwise. Again, that because of the same reason that our aim is deadlock avoidance. So, we shall be discussing the two algorithms in the next lecture. Till then, please keep watching CEC. Thank you.